I think we're all right. I think we are live now. Um, Welcome everybody to week two of the uh, Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month or HISAM for short. Um, for this week and next, we are going to be featuring talks from Vau Kanaka or the inland region where people may live or occasionally frequent, usually considered below the Vau Akua. Um, in addition to the talk today, we have some other exciting talks scheduled for this week uh, tomorrow at um, one o'clock, there's going to be a uh, talk on the coconut rhinoceros beetle treatments from our CRB team. And tomorrow evening, um, Molly Murphy from the plant pono specialist from the Big Island Invasive Species Committee will be um, talking about what's in my backyard, a guide to plant identification, keep it or not. Um, and um, this talk will be scheduled from 6 to 7 p.m. So cancel your plans for tomorrow night. You don't want to miss that. Um, before I go on, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Chuck Camara. I am the weed risk assessment specialist and support staff with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. Um, and before I can uh, go on any further, I also want to thank um, staff of the Big Island Invasive Species Committee, many who are online right now, who are going to be our technical support staff for today. And I also want to lay all the blame on them if anything goes wrong. Um, Recordings of today's talk should be available on the BISC website in about a week. So if you missed anything today, or if you didn't get to catch the whole thing, you should be able to catch a, um, a recording of that in about a week. So as our speaker today, I am very happy to introduce a former fellow graduate student in the UH Botany Department and the current Extension Specialist in Ecosystems and Fire in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management at UH Manoa, Dr. Clay Trowernick. Clay is originally from Long Island, New York, fellow New Yorker, and came to Hawaii in 1999 as a USGS intern on the Palila project. He turned his attention to plants through graduate studies at UH Manoa, where I first met him, and later at the University of Tasmania. He's been doing research and outreach as an extension specialist faculty member in the Department of Natural Resources and environmental management at UH Manoa since 2013. Although his focus for the past decade has been on fire in Hawaii and other Pacific Islands, he has recently switched gears to develop a new extension program on ecosystem conservation and restoration in partnership with the Army Natural Resource Program on Oahu. Uh, Clay also told me that even though we were in grad school together over 20 years ago, he thinks neither of us has aged a day. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Clay now, and his, the title of his talk is A Landscape Perspective on Fire and Invasive Species in Hawaii. Thanks, Clay. That's true, Chuck. You're looking great. <laughs> the filter on Zoom. <laughs> right. That's right. Thanks, everybody. All right. I'm going to share screen, and uh, it is true. I am giving this talk on, first of all, is everyone, is that like normal presenter mode? Can someone, I don't see any thumbs up here, but I'm going to. No, that, that is the, that is the, um, yeah, that is not the normal presenter. Mode. Oh boy. How do I, no, I don't have a swap screen. How about this? Is that normal? Oh, wait, the previous one was good. Sorry. Boy. Oh boy. <laughs> I How already screwed up. I had it right. I no excuses so. at this point. Um, all right. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, so I, I kind of changed it to the Pacific just because I've been doing fire um, and uh, kind of thinking about the Pacific region, uh, especially kind of as you get out into the western, some of the westernmost islands. So I'll talk a little bit about them, but thanks for the introduction. Um, and like I was going to say- Clay, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, I no. guess we are still seeing presenter mode. Uh, sorry about How that. How about now? Still, still presenter. Just okay. smaller. How about, hang on a second. I'm going to get out of this. It worked for a second. I swear we tested this. Um, Zoom, share screen. How about now? That looks good. <laughs> All right. So you guys are all here, I think, because of this, uh, you know, invasive species, and we kind of probably all have a pretty fairly good understanding of the impact that um, invasive species have uh, on ecosystems in Hawaii and kind of actually all these new ecosystems, right, that, that kind of are being the, the 
forming in front of our eyes. Um, and that's kind of really where our fire issue lies, which I'm going to talk about. Um, but, you know, this landscape scale perspective, I didn't really start thinking about things this size uh, until I started thinking about fire because of the extent to which these uh, just sort of disturbances happen um, and that the scale, right, at which they happen. And so just, just like keep things in perspective. Um, of all the ecosystem cover, right, we have in Hawaii about uh, 1.3 million acres are dominated by native species, more or less. This is coming from um, the carbon assessment that USGS put out. So this is kind of work led by Jim Jacoby. And about a one and a half million acres are uh, introduced species dominate those, those, uh, those areas. So it's like, you know, just the scale scope of the problem is pretty, uh, pretty astonishing. Um, and I'll kind of come back to this in a, in a, in a bit here. Um, and so three ideas I kind of want to cover is a, is a kind of a bigger picture of fire. This is the, it's like, again, the scale that I've been thinking about things and uh, how I think it's helpful um, for us to like effectively deal with fire. Um, a little bit about why, well, not a little bit, but why weeds are actually our fire problem. And I think kind of you know, extending beyond just this typical grasses burn and, you know, they burn into our forest, but um, what happens sort of after in the aftermath, just kind of using a couple of case studies. And then I think more broadly towards the end, this is idea of reorienting. Um, and I think it sort of helped how fires helped me kind of shift my perspective on uh, the role that people play and history has played in kind of where we're at with this stuff. So, Big example of a big, big fire, um, 2018, uh, the west side of Oahu burned, like just call it the west side fires. There's actually two distinct fires started by multiple ignitions. Apparently a guy was chucking flares off the back of a motorbike, uh, hit Makaha first and then ripped around a Waianae. This thing burned for days. I think the back of Makaha burned, was still burning two weeks after this fire. And I'm going to bring our attention right to this bright, 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 bright green spot. This is a weird trick of satellite imagery. So the green isn't really that green. But in this case, um, this is the golf course in Makaha. And I just, this picture, <laughs> I kind of can't keep staring. I can't stop staring at this picture because it sort of raises lots of questions and I think makes a lot of these contradictions apparent. Um, like on the one hand, what's happening here, right? I mean, he's got these people playing golf and sort of oblivious to what the heck's going on around them. I mean, that's probably no surprise, but at the same time, you know, if we wanna make choices as a society about how we maintain certain areas and how we neglect others, right? This is the, where we can actually intervene, right? So the only thing that didn't burn uh, literally in this fire was, was the golf course. <laughs> so um, take that for what it's worth, but I think, you know, it's really, important to for like understand the context in which these incidents are happening, uh, not in just terms of invasive species, but like where are we using water in the landscape? What are we valuing? What are we prioritizing? Um, and if people are able to play golf while the mountain's on fire, uh, things are not quite aligned uh, for the health of our, our whole society, right? Um, and this is an old problem. This is the other thing that I really want to bring home uh, to you guys here today is that uh, the first major fire incident that we sort of know of that was reported and written about was this 1901 Hamakua fire. There are plenty of accounts of the use of fire by Hawaiians going way further back than this uh, as a management tool. Um, I'm not really going to talk too much about that, uh, but it's also important to realize and understand this kind of human connection that we have to fire as a tool, and it's pretty, pretty universal across the world. But um, 1901, 30,000 acres burned, and these guys had it figured out, like even then, right? The whole problem is conserving the water supply, which depends on the preservation of existing forests and restocking some of denuded slopes. So they had these Bureau of Forestry guys come out and try to scratch their heads. Happening on the wet side, this huge, huge fire. What happened to that was we had the first forest warden program start, which was like the progenitor of Division of Forestry and Wildlife. They established the first forest reserve. So the Hamakua Forest Reserve was established after this fire. And this idea that, okay, maybe we need to kind of watch and what's going on with these forests and watersheds. Um, and the interest here in particular, right, was for plantation agriculture, right? So there was a very directed uh, interest, vested interest in this case. Um, but, you know, as the saying goes, the first time's a tragedy, the second time's farce, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth time. This is what that looked like coming around the corner in 2018, rounding uh, the point on West Oahu, seeing the whole mountain look like it was burning up. 
Um, and we're just seeing this again and again and again, right? So 2019, this is probably the most predictable fire in recent memory or uh, sort of outcome in recent memories when they took out sugarcane plantation. So that's kind of a hint about where I'll be going a little bit later. Um, you know, almost the entire Central Valley burned that year and the areas that didn't burn actually burned the summer after that. Kaholave is a kind of whole other kind of history there, um, but this idea that you have kind of these established, uh, well-established grass and shrublands that just carry fire, uh, as you can see in this picture, um, uh, very, very easily across the landscape. And then the most recent example, uh, the Mono Road fire, uh, a lot of people were propping this up as the largest in our history, but there's actually a bigger one, uh, 1969 that burned above um, on a Hulu on the, on the big island. So at any rate, you can see, uh, you know, this sort of problem is a landscape scale problem. It's this really, really large extents of grasslands throughout the state. And we can kind of intuitively identify really what's going on here. Um, and I kind of talked about this, actually I was asked to do an op-ed for the Hill. I was kind of nervous about this, but basically like, we can look at the causes. What's cool about fires, you can look at the causes and the drivers a little bit more specifically than just, yeah, grass. If you have grass, it's going to burn and kind of understand how not only do we have a choice to intervene, but it's actually one of these few sort of disturbance events that's linked clearly to climate change uh, that, that we actually have control over. We have, we have some say in, in how this uh, pans out in the future. And so this is where we're at. Um, this is just annual area burn. So also kind of a, a result of that big 1901 fire. They've been tracking area burned um, uh, over the history of the past century or so. So we can see that we're kind of running off this cliff, right? This big spike in 1969 was that fire that I just mentioned above on Hulu. And then um, you know, we're sort of running off this cliff in recent decades. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is, but uh, it's also interesting to understand that we've got similar patterns in the Western Pacific. So I'm kind of talking about Guam, um, Palau, and Yap, which are out in this side, uh, the sort of US affiliated Pacific Islands. Um, this is really driven by the Asian monsoon. So these guys are influenced by the Asian monsoons. So they've really pronounced dry seasons, uh, but also uh, extensive grasslands that sort of dry fire out there. And so just as an example, if you take total land area, and so you divide the area burned per year by the total land area, in other words, like how much there is to burn, and you get a percent of land area burned annually, Hawaii is down here. And actually, if you take Hawaii and compare it to the states on the mainland, we're actually about even and many years worse off than the big Western states, including California, uh, places like that. But then you start looking at this across the other islands in the Pacific, and they're literally off the charts. And just as an example, here is four years uh, that the U.S. Forest Service has been mapping fires on Guam, and you just start wrapping your head around the extent of these fires and like, what does it mean to like control, right? Suppression, like how, what, what resources or capacity do you really have? Uh, to deal with these things, okay? Um, so what's going on? And this is kind of this classic slide. I use these all the time, but it's a really kind of useful model to understand fire occurrence. And by fire regime, what I'm talking about is not just the incidence of one single fire, but over time, like what drives and what, how do we characterize fires uh, in a given sort of ecosystem or in a given region, right? And it's these big sort of big scale drivers of this. And basically for the Pacific Islands, it's almost all human caused ignitions, right? So we're talking about 98 to 99% of our fires are caused by people. Uh, from what limited data we have in Hawaii, about 75% of those are accidental and 25% intentional. So that's a whole other sort of realm to think about of what, what's going on with this intentionally uh, started fires. And then the vegetation, of course, for um, fire science, that's just the fuel, what's out there to burn. And we, I think, are all very familiar, folks interested in invasive species, at least, with this idea that grasses carry fire very readily. Um, and so we've been seeing this expansion of these grasslands, or they're called savannas in lots of other parts of the world. Um, and on different timescales, I'll get a little bit about the timescale and the history about what, what's driving that uh, a little bit later. And then, of course, climate. Um, we're all very familiar with drought and fire, right? That's kind of the immediate connection that people think. But some of the work uh, that I've done here in Hawaii actually shows that heavy rainfall events prior to dry seasons is, can increase fire risk more so than drought. And the reason that ties us right back to the grasslands, um, we have these 
grass dominated ecosystems covering tons and tons and tons of land area. And when it rains, the grass grows, responds very readily. So as our climate becomes more variable in terms of rainfall events and drought, these grasses out there make our environment, our landscape incredibly sensitive to fire risk. Um, and then of course, El Nino is the big example where on average, we tend to get wetter than average summers followed by a very dry winter leading into the next dry season. And that's like Pacific wide. So you see fires uh, on some of the wettest islands out there during these El Nino events. And of course, all this is really interesting from a fire science perspective, but there's a reason, you know, and pretty much is what, fire threatens, right? So we're worried about the danger that it poses to the things that we value. So in this case, you know, the picture here is the ecosystem. This is a 2010 fire on the big island that burned up above Pohakaloa towards Mauna Kea State Park. And all of those little white dots, unfortunately, in there are um, rings of ash from the Nayo and Mamani forest that burnt up in that fire. And the other things from maybe from an ecological or a management perspective is the effects that fire have. So what is it doing to the vegetation, the soils, right? And what, how are we kind of anticipating these impacts and kind of can reduce those impacts um, in the aftermath? Um, and then of course, fire threat ties us back to communities too. I mean, the biggest interest of anyone uh, is really to um, prevent fires from burning up their homes and things they care about. So that also provides clues about how we can intervene, right? So you look at these three circles in this picture, there's really only two things that we have any control over. And actually there's only one thing that we have direct control over, right? So climate is a kind of more abstract global scale phenomenon and thing that we need to deal with, right? Like, you know, we need to talk realistically about decarbonizing and getting off fossil fuels because adapting to these changes is only gonna take us so far. So that is a very real conversation, a real imminent threat that's within kind of human, human uh, power to, to influence. But locally, what we can really deal with is vegetation. That's the only thing that we can actually directly go and change, right? So I can mow fire breaks, I can graze grasses down, I can manipulate the vegetation, I can put a golf course in and make it nice and bright green, right? Um, and that will make it less likely to burn. Um, and then ignitions is a tricky one, right? But, you know, we kind of think about it in the sense of if we have 75% accidental ignitions, that means that those are pre presumably preventable, right? If people were just being a little bit smarter that day. And so that can inform outreach, like how you address this uh, problem through just public education, public awareness, uh, not, you know, using machinery and welding on hot, dry, windy days, things like that. Um, the other thing we can do that's kind of running here, this little GIF that's circling through, is we can use these to actually predict fire risks, to sort of increase readiness and kind of be better at predicting when fire risk is high. Uh, and that sort of, there's a bunch of applications that has for sort of getting firefighters more prepared or knowing when the risk is high, public awareness again and outreach, so communicating risk, um, as well as, um, well, trying to, you know, prevent accidental ignitions, right? So for example, forestry department might wanna limit access to certain parks and things like that if it's, if it's really dry out. And this all kind of is getting bundled up at a national level um, and international as well. There's this idea, but it's actually a written document that's called the Cohesive Strategy for Wildland Fire Management. And this sort of strategy recognizes that there are many, many, many operators, many players in this role. Um, and my friends at Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization love to say like everyone has a part from like planners to like homeowners to, you know, agencies to re emergency responders, all of these people can help deal with this problem, but it kind of puts it in this framework of fire resilient landscapes. In other words, making our landscapes a little bit able, like the impacts less and also the ability for them to kind of regenerate better and fire adapted communities, right? So just safer uh, communities with respect to wildfire. And I think for us over the years, this really means like trying to take fire specific knowledge, which seems maybe like a little bit out there and uh, specialized, but um, showing that it really aligns well with local knowledge. And it's really comes down to what are the things that you value in this local spaces? Um, and what are the actions that you can take locally to, to reduce risk? And as part of this kind of effort, this is a Pacific Fire Exchange. We've been doing this project for our program for about 10 years now. It's funded by the Joint Fire Science Program. And we are, we're a part of a network of exchanges across the country who kind of deal regionally um, I would say our main target audience has been 
land managers and conservation folks, uh, people kind of working out on the land, trying to make their meet their information needs with respect to fire. So from pre-fire planning to kind of doing mitigation and fire breaks, that kind of stuff, um, and really trying to help provide the best available information. And just sort of as a plug, we're doing a um, weed risk assessment tool. This has been developed uh, with funding by the Pacific Island Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, a student, Kevin Vicenda, in, in the botany department with Kurt Daler. And so they'll be presenting on that, or Kevin will be presenting on that next week. So please uh, jump on the website there. You can register and check that out. I'm going to say any more to that, but if you have questions, um, you, can, you can ask later. Um, but back to like these local effects, right? I think a lot of, for a lot of us, uh, this is the more familiar story with fire. Uh, and if it's not familiar, this is what I'm going to tell you what it is. Now, this grass fire cycle, right? It's the idea that you have these grasslands established and they're often adjacent to our forests. And once those grasses increase the risk and threat of fire, they burn, those fires penetrate into the forest and then the trees die and they're replaced by more grass, which sort of primes the landscape for the next fire. And so the pattern that we see on the ground is this kind of contraction of that forest edge. You know, on the smaller islands, Oahu and Kauai, it's typically like the forest kind of moving uphill. I think on Big Island and Maui, you can argue you're kind of seeing it from both sides, right? Because you get these upper elevation grasslands as well. And so really well established. Now it's kind of part and parcel to fire theory and fire science globally, but it was really established by some uh, pioneering work in Hawaii in, the, in Volcanoes National Park. And all of this though is to say, this is kind of the idea this is like at the local scale. Like I'm thinking about these plots that I just did where fires happen and I can see the impacts it's had on tree mortality, things like that. But again, when you try to scale this up to the problem across the landscape, what we're really dealing with is these oceans of grass, right? That sort of surround all of these forested resources that typically are the things that we're interested in protecting, either through invasive species management, through ungulate removal, um, or their resources in themselves, right? Some of these grasslands provide hunting, they provide forage for cattle, right? So it's trying to kind of contextualize this, that there is a huge kind of spatial scale uh, at which we're trying to deal with. And so we really need to think about being strategic and where we focus these kinds of efforts and, and the, like this bigger picture uh, threat. Um, my student, Matt Lucas, uh, who is working on climate stuff with Tom John Beluca right now at UH, he developed a really cool product for his master's thesis in which we were able to map percent for uh, woody cover and percent cover of um, herbaceous vegetation. So woody vegetation, herbaceous vegetation and bare earth percent cover across the whole state on annual time steps. And it kind of gives this really simplified, it works for fire, really simplified view of the extent of grass, which is essentially the green here and the extent of, of woody tree cover, right? Which is in, in the purple. And when you overlay the fire history in these slides that I'm showing you, you get that really clear sense, right? About not only the vulnerability of our forested areas in the sense that they're just surrounded by, by grasses, but then where these fires are happening, right? So almost in all cases, with the exception of a few incidents here, you can see there's this Kipapa fire that happened in 2015 on Oahu up high, for example, but with almost all um, cases in these grasslands and they're sort of approaching up the slopes and, and kind of penetrating or kind of eroding away the edge of these forests. Maui, same pattern. So it's sort of the, the, the same cycle, but again, thinking about this on, on large, large scale and, and just sort of the extent of the challenge uh, that we're dealing with. So the folks were, Big Island, I'm sure this is no surprise you where, where your where your hotspot for fires is in this belt here. But again, we can take this information uh, and we can actually use it to model fire risk. I don't really want to delve into the details too much, but fire risk and fire danger has been a really tough nut to crack for uh, Hawaii because our climate variability is so high and all of the tools that have been developed for the for the continental US just don't really translate because we're talking about tropical ecosystems. We're talking about lots of weird mixes of invasive species. So we take this really simplified land cover. We use climate variability that Tom John Beluca's team is doing to try to capture that variability in space and, and actually time. And we're actually able to sort of translate that into fire probability surfaces for the state. And so this is sort of forthcoming work I mean, it's here it is, but we're able to do projections with this too, kind of what's going to happen in the future. And then ultimately what we're dealing doing with this with Tom's group is that we're 
developing daily climate products. So that rainfall, temperature, relative humidity is gonna be coming out on daily time steps. And these maps will be able to be produced in real time effectively, right? To understand where risk is high and how it's changing uh, over time. But back to this idea of intervention, right? Like this kind of sets us up to understand where is risk high. And in the example of these models, we've used them already to kind of look at this as an example at Pu'uawa where we have restoration happening. And so we worked with these economists, Kim Burnett and her, uh, her, her researcher, Chris Wada, to kind of look at what the heck would it cost as a scenario just to do full bore restoration across the watershed. So this light green here is uh, grass and the dark green is forest cover. What would happen to fire risk if you just went full bore forest restoration? Um, the cost, the price tag of this is about $60 million. So, I mean, you know, it's not that, that bad. It's, you could do it. Um, and you can see, we could actually project fire into the future. And if we have continuous forest cover, we get a much greater reduction in, in that future predicted fire risk. So again, pointing to these kind of landscape metrics and landscape approaches that we could deal, uh, we could potentially do, um, you know, if we dream big enough. And then, I think on a on a smaller scale, uh, thinking at the, the plot level, right? So this again, this is idea I'm trying to get at where these weeds, how they're driving fire risk, right? How these invasive species drive fire risk. Um, not only in addition to kind of driving the risk of a fire in the future, but they are also really causing us problems uh, for, in terms of the impacts of fire. And so I'm taking you guys to this little corner, Kumaipo Ridge, up here on Oahu, at the back, kind of top of Wainaikai Forest Reserve. Um, there was a fire in 2004, and we had put plots in there back then. And in 2017, we went back and found all these old plots and kind of looked at what happened. And there was a big management response. So this was a very special place to the community um, down below. So Eric Enos with Kala Farms and Wai'anae Mountain Watershed Partnership, or what would become the, part, the partnership, got involved in trying to restore this area. Um, and so you can see right now, all of this green fluffy canopy uh, is koa coming back, right? So these koa trees, if you walk through there now, you probably wouldn't be able to tell there was a fire. Um, but it sort of had some pretty big impacts. We're talking really beautiful music, diverse uh, Hawaiian forest. And um, the sort of lesson learned from this after we went back, you know, they, they did restoration with some of these common trees, koa, li'i, and maile. Um, but you can see it's sort of a pale, uh, compa pale comparison to what was there prior. So the top is sort of the number of trees across that site um, and, and in terms of the overstory. And then down below uh, was what was there prior. Uh, so the adjacent forest that did not burn. Um, and you can just see our restoration efforts, they helped this thing place along, but we really were struggling. And um, I think the big thing here is like, you know, when we think about koa, right, it's a really strong tree, a really useful tree for restoration, but it's also kind of a pioneer species in and of itself, right? So other species will fill in over time. Uh, and what we're looking at now is these other non-native trees that are starting to kind of like diversify that canopy. Um, and we're not getting any of these other elements that, that were there prior. So this all this to say is that like, even at the site level, thinking about fire and its aftermath, you know, it's really the weeds that, um, cause us grief. Uh, and koa on its own came back like crazy, right? So there we planted koa, but we didn't really even need to. Like so much koa came in after this. Um, but again, the understory right now is kind of just locked in clydemia and that uh, what's the non-native nephrolopus brownie, I think it is. Uh, so again, it's kind of like the fire in and of itself isn't as much of a problem as, as the um, as the weeds that either carry it in the case of these big oceans of grasslands or the weeds that come in post fire and establish uh, in these sites. So just to kind of show you the array of species that were there prior to the burn that aren't represented anymore. Um, and then I think try to like kind of wrap this up, but like the other side of this is fire adapted communities. And um, here's uh, Uncle Eric Enos giving a little rundown of that 2018 fire uh, on one of the farms in Waianae Kai. And we've kind of been rallying around these incidents, and especially since that incident, uh, getting more of the community involved in um, fire-related projects. So this is with uh, Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization and this hui of farmers and uh, land managers over there. Uh, have been doing a lot of work, a lot of different projects across the valley and trying to link up with the schools. 
So this is including DOFA, Division of Forestry and Wildlife Projects, uh, some of the farmers kind of taking things on their own and Ka'ala Farms um, doing, doing some, some intervention. So one of the projects that Uncle Eric is working on is actually flooding um, old Lo'i back behind the farm as a fire break. Um, as one other example, I just learned about this recently in West Maui. I think there's, a, there's a, some areas there where they're trying to do the same thing. Um, DOFA has been working on this vegetated fire break on the side of the forest road, the forest access road for about, I think in 2014 or so they started. And so you can see this is actually after a fire. So in this weed mat, you've got some singed native plants um, on this side, and then the halicoa, and what was there was guinea grass. Um, and it actually provided them a safe space to work and contain the fire to that side of the road, right? So they are actually able to use this space, prevent it from jumping um, over, their, over their heads. And so it's actually like already becoming functional. Oops. And then the, one of the projects I'm most excited about is our friend Bula. Yeah, yeah, who's over here. Um, he has like this top farm lot that kind of connects down from this big ridge that sort of divides the valley and kind of this upper and lower area. And so his farm sits right at this sort of pinch point and he's been working with sheep to try to graze a, a, a break, a fire break across this. And so like, you know, we've been working with folks in Waianae for years and years and it's only really like in response to these incidents being in the right place in the right time. Uh, that kind of people come together. And now we've got um, Kei Fukuda with UH. She is has a program with Waianae High School where they're getting students to actually help Bula work with Eric on these different fire mitigation projects as part of the summer program. So really, really cool stuff um, coming along. And so they don't get these incidents, right? And actually this is the fire that happened after we started hooing up and this sort of text chain went out uh, in response to this fire to everybody and um, Bula, whose farm is right there, was actually able to let the fire department get up to this access road and they were able to hold the fire at that, at that pinch point. So we're actually like we're seeing real things happen, right? Real, real tangible results is pretty satisfying. And then just to kind of end, I think like for me, fires changed my perspective in a lot of ways. I mean, I think not even, you know, I worked with fire in other parts of the world, and um, it's a very different perspective that people have um, more trying to kind of reframe this as a tool uh, on one hand, but also just thinking about these landscapes in which fire is happening. Uh, and like, I think a lot of folks in conservation would look at this place, for example, in this photo and just say, oh, it's, it's trash, like literally, right? That's the word we use, junk, trash, right? And I think that we need to have real conversations with people, or in order to have real conversations, we need to like be careful how we frame these things. Like, are they invaded? Are they degraded? Right. And um, when we're working with ranchers in particular with fire, like this is a valued resource to them and they provide really critical support uh, in terms of fire, the, the ability for us to manage these, this like scale uh, of the problem. Right. Um, same. So this is really what I was getting back to or hinting at earlier is that our fire problem in Hawaii is really most linkly, closely tied to our change in land use. So right, so we're in this post-plantation era, uh, era where we're not using, we're using a fraction. So this lower graph here shows um, millions of acres in production and the change. So we've gone from pasture and even plantation agriculture, we've seen about 60% declines. And this is really what's causing the grass fire cycle for us, right? It's not that fire is creating the grasslands. It's literally our like disuse of land that's creating the problem, right? So this is where large scale solutions kind of require kind of reorienting our perspective about how we benefit from using the land and, and, and how like not using land, not making decisions sets us up for trouble. Similar situation when you get into the Western Pacific, the yellow and green, the yellow is savanna cover, the green is forest cover. So these vast areas of savannas uh, dot all of these um, Western Pacific islands. So Yap, Saipan, uh, Guam, Tinian, Rota, all of the cent these are the CNMI, and uh, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, and also uh, the easternmost sort of areas of Micronesia. And this is a much deeper history, right? And uh, this goes back to burning by people. So this little figure, it's kind of a lot going on, but what we're seeing on these lines is charcoal, glycenia, which is another name for aluhe, uh, and, and grass, poaceae. So we're seeing savanna species and charcoal. And if we kind of orient ourselves to this side of being in the deep history or not that deep, but 10,000 years ago up to present, 
what we're seeing is very little signal of these savanna species or fire. And then all of a sudden we hit 4,000, 3,000 years ago when people arrived on the island and then they flip the switch, right? So they're starting to burn. So in other words, these landscapes that we see today are anthropogenic. They're created by people using fire uh, in very intentional ways. And so again, when we think about these, like are these degraded landscapes? Well, in the Western Pacific, these are all native species we're talking about in these savannas, right? And so uh, there's just a way that we frame these things might not kind of comport or like align with how people who live there think about these landscapes. So just to be uh, cognizant of that. This is Yap, um, Ramong Island in the north of Yap. And the story kind of goes even deeper. You look at the savanna that's surrounding these forest patches. And if you see these furrows across the hills and these furrows in the foreground there, those are all agricultural ditches, right? So now we're kind of linking us back to the story, more recent history in Hawaii, where prior to these savannas, you actually had land, lands being actively used for, for agriculture. Um, and again, land use, land history, understanding these changes and kind of what we're valuing and, and able to do as a society is really gonna dictate where we head with fire in the future. Um, there's a, actually a shot of a burn area where these ridges and ditch systems become really prevalent uh, when, when it burns, of course. Same thing for anywhere you go in Hawaii after a fire, you're, you're bound to find um, archeological remains. But again, there's also ecological things, ecological uh, resources that we have to worry about that won't recover uh, after these incidents, right? So we need to be also um, reminded that it's going to take a lot of work uh, on the conservation management side. So this is Keao Valley that burned in that 2018 fire, probably one of the biggest stands of Willy Willy, at least on Oahu. Um, and uh, almost all of these trees died in that fire. So it's pretty, pretty heartbreaking. Um, and that kind of leads me to my work now, just as like a little teaser, but building this new program, kind of doing the stuff we've done for fire, but trying to focus more on conservation and restoration. And um, don't really have a good name for it, but this sort of purpose is just like to help the people who are doing this work, right? And the, all the kind of watershed work that's happening um, and trying to make sure people are communicating and sharing ideas and that, you know, lessons that, that people have learned are, are accessible to people. Uh, across the board. And this is again, as I think Chuck mentioned at the beginning, or maybe I did, but this is in partnership with the Army Natural Resource Program on Oahu. So just a shout out to them. You know, we're all, uh, <laughs> we all got problems or scratch our heads around. This was how do you move a chipper uh, across the mountain slope from one site to another um, without the use of helicopters. That was a pretty fun day. So anyway, back to this sort of big picture thing, right? Look, what, what are the needs and priorities across all these folks doing this work? Um, and how do we share and promote these, these best management practices? Identify them and then promote them so that we make our, makes our work easier. So with that, uh, sorry if I was kind of speeding along, but I felt like I had a lot of slides to get through. I thank you guys for, for tuning in. Um, I got a couple questions in the chat for you, but before sure. we do that, I'm going to run a poll real quick. Sure. As the poll's running, it's re it'll be really quick. Um, we can get into the questions. Let me bring it up real quick. Uh, so the first question is, um, where you had the maps of the tree cover and grass cover, are those available on the Pacific Fire Exchange? Um, no, but email me and I can make, I can make them available. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, they're, they're, they're kind of large and, um, we actually just recently made them easier to interpret, uh, so that they'll actually be usable. And so to specify what they are is this estimates of cover for three land cover types. So you've got bare earth, woody cover, herbaceous cover, and they're at annual time steps from 2016 to 20. 20, sorry, 1999 to 2016. Uh, thank you. And then when you get a chance, just put your email in the chat for everybody. Yeah, sure. And then the next question is, how do you compare the fire incidents in the Pacific Islands with the Caribbean islands? Is it similar or are they kind of different? Such a good question. I, you know, the, I've only talked with a couple of firefighters. Um, I haven't really spoken with researchers that are focusing on this in the Caribbean. Um, and from what I've heard too, that they're dealing with similar issues. So then one, this one guy was just like, oh my gosh, it's guinea grass. You know, like, yeah, I've seen it happen. Guinea grass burns and it burns up into the forest. And then 
I was like, well, then what are you, what are you guys doing about it? He's like, I don't know. What do you do? About it? <laughs> so, um, and I, I think one of the big differences there, and we're actually just got asked to write a chapter on this and kind of collaborate with some researchers from the Caribbean. My interest is like, are the forests or like the plant species there more or less sensitive uh, to fire? Just given that they're kind of closer to the mainland, right? I would kind of assume you have maybe some more or better fire adaptations and maybe less sensitivity to weeds than we have here. Um, and I dropped my email, by the way, uh, in the sort of check. Um, so I think, again, they're dealing with a lot of similar things like post-plantation landscapes, you know, this sort of switch away from, from plantation agriculture and what's happened in the, in the aftermath of that uh, is probably pretty similar. We've got these African grasses are kind of all over the place. So, um, and the, the, the fuel loads that these grasslands, I have to say that too, like the fuels that we see in these grasslands in Hawaii, you know, I said, oh, they're like these savannas we have in other parts of the world, but they're unlike these savannas because we get these monotypic stands of things like guinea grass and fountain grass. I mean, the fuel loads are not anywhere comparable. They're much, 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 much higher here in Hawaii than we see anywhere else in the world. And it's probably due to the fact we don't have like lots of different grazers. We don't have lots of different species, grasses competing with one another. Uh, and in a lot of these places, we're not seeing fires as frequently as would happen, let's say in like an African savanna or a, you know, South American savanna. Yeah, thank you. I think this is the last question. Um, so I guess managed herds have always been shown as an effective tool for fuel reduction, like you're talking about the sheep and all that stuff. Um, but do you know if anyone's ever looked at or try to quantify like the unmanaged herds? Yes. Uh, one of our students just came out with a paper. I'm going to try to find a link to it. But yes, actually, we did. He studied this on the big island. Um, and he showed that unmanaged ungulates can have an impact, but it's, um, it's really tied more to moisture. So I think it was in these moister areas, you see a bigger difference between sort of, you know, where you had like feral, feral ungulates and, and fence, fencing them out. Um, but then that effect really declined and you got into drier areas. But I can send a share a link to that paper in the chat. It's something we're hoping to like translate to something that's more accessible than, than the manuscript. But that's, we, we, he just published that. Clay, I just wanted to mention uh, JB Friday commented on your uh, comparisons of the Caribbean and Pacific Islands and said that the native flora of Caribbean of the Caribbean regenerates much better in disturbed areas than the Pacific flora does. So uh, yeah, that's what would have been my hunch. Um, yeah. Uh, and I guess there's also big sort of differences in terms of rainfall, you know, between here and there, where I don't think that a lot of those islands get such huge rain shadow effects like we get here. I think some of the larger ones probably do, but I know a lot of the Caribbean islands are pretty dry. Um, but they'd also, well, and also probably a much longer history of burning in the sense that people would have been there for a much longer history and using fire in those places. Um, yeah, and I just dropped the link to that paper that Tim, it's called Moisture Availability and Ecological Restoration Limit Fine Fuels and Model Biofire Intensity Following Non-Native Ungulate Removal in Hawaii. So he actually looked not only at areas that had been had ungulates excluded, but then he also looked at Puawa and some of the places where they were doing intensive restoration and showed that you really, you really knock down um, fire risk, essentially. But yeah, someone had mentioned, you don't have enough stock or density to create good fire break with feral ungulates. I think that's exactly right. Like if you're not, you know, from the grazers and ranchers that I've talked to, you, it's a really intentional thing, right? You move them into a place very, very strategically. Um, so you're knocking fuels down like along roadsides and things like that. So just having them out there, um, it may reduce risk somewhat. And there's some anecdotal accounts of like um, some of these areas where they've, <clears throat> fenced and move the ungulates and then you get a fire. But at the same time, I don't think they're, it's not like safe just to have them out there and you can assume that fire risk is low. Um, here's another question in the chat. I'll just go for it. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on why a monotypic grassland, guinea grass, fountain grass, et cetera, have a higher fuel loads than a more diverse grassland? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. My, this is just like hunches and it probably might be related to less species diversity and interspecific like this competition, um, but also the fact that there are like grazing animals in these systems or there's reg more regular fires, right? So part of the problem may be that like we do get big fires in grasslands in Hawaii, but you actually are pretty well, we're pretty good at excluding fires. Like our firefighters do a phenomenal job. Like if you think about that, it's something along the lines of, um, I didn't talk about this, but I think on Oahu, we get about 600 ignitions a year. So statewide is about a thousand ignitions a year and maybe 10 of those, right, become these big fires. So the firefighters are putting out a ton of these fires. And so they're actually excluding. So one of the effects could just be the fact that the grasslands aren't burning a regular cycle enough. So they're able to just keep building up biomass. Um, but I do think there might be something to do with sort of just that, that competition, right? You've sort of got other species trying to compete for resources. And so it doesn't allow, for example, the most aggressive species, which is like guinea grass to, to establish or, or fountain grass for that matter. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of an, un, an open question. It's not really, we don't really understand uh, exactly why that, that is. Just, just my guesses. Um, although we do know that it's like they're humongous. I've sent the, these biomass measurements from grasslands to, to colleagues and they think that I have like got errors in the data because they just, they don't believe um, it can be so big. And I, I, I had a, oh, I, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just had a quick question. I, I, I think you may have answered this in a later slide, but um, in, in an early one of your slides, you were comparing, I think, percentage of area burned in Hawaii compared to other uh, islands throughout the Pacific. And I think you later touched upon like the presence of humans and the period, the, the time since uh, people have arrived and they've been involved with actively burning. Would you say that's the, the reason why such a high Percentage, or percentage relatively of acreage on these islands has burned? Is it species composition? Is there different human activities taking place? Or is it just a, a matter of, of time since people have arrived? I think there's probably a few things happening. One of the, so there's a little bit of debate out there. I mean, I sold the story that I pretty convinced on is that this is just like an anthropogenic effect. There's some, there's a counter argument to that, that talks about the soils out there and that they're very, very old. You know, so you're talking like 40 million years old, some of these soils, very depleted, low nutrients. And so the, some of my argument is, well, these savannas, we know the savannas were always there, right? So these species were present, they're, they're, they're indigenous to these islands, but the argument is that they increase in extent after burning. Um, and so, it's probably a combination of just the fact of how the, the fires we're seeing now is this product of the extent of those savannas now, right? So for example, Guam, it's about a quarter of their land area is savanna. Um, and the, they're being ignited largely intentionally, right? So in Guam, one of the big sources of fires, at least again, this is according to the folks locally is that it's hunters. So they burn areas that increase access and, um, and increase the forage quality for deer. They're hunting access deer there. Um, and then the other side of it, what did you mention about sort of, I don't, so I don't know, I don't know the extent to which like that long history has contributed to that. If you look at the story on Yap, for example, it more aligns with what we're seeing now in Hawaii. Like those savannas where you're actually seeing all these old agricultural ditch systems, suggests to me that the savanna itself might be relatively new, right? Like that, that the extent that we see now might really be since Europeans contact and you have a population decline on YAP from they estimate about 70,000 people to 7,000, right? So think about that sort of impact um, on, you know, someone, someone said to me, oh, is it YAP like, they're the least colonized and you're like, dude, it's like <laughs> these guys got hammered by that process, right? And so it's like this sort of pale uh, pale picture of what it was before, right? But you get some evidence there of that happening. Guam, I'm not entirely sure, or I don't even know if the work has, it's not as obvious, let's say that, um, but there is quite, uh, there's quite a number of papers out there on like archeological finds and, and distribution of archeological sites. And that tends to suggest that they're, pretty well distributed across these landscapes. And so what we may be seeing is like actually a function of population decline, 
and that shift away from using these lands. And then the, as these savannas were established and people were actively burning, um, that they just kind of let that let those fires and that grass fire cycle kind of perpetuate. Um, it's hard to say, right? Because even with those pollen records, like grass creates tons of pollen, right? So is the increase, relative abundance increase in pollen, does that actually correlate exactly with like the extent of these like, savannas or is it just the fact that they kind of there was a bump so you get an increase you know what i mean in other words like the savannas indicators from pollen could have been increasing uh or have increased but you're still getting pretty big fluctuations in the extent of those ecosystems it's just that there's there was more of them after people arrived um and then rachel says a comment in there oops although i might skip i might have skipped ahead you have one one question before that. How will the real time fire risks from the new tools being developed be communicated to the public? Yeah, so that's also going to be that's also in the works. So there's this product coming out or a website coming out called the Hawaii. Oh my gosh, Hawaii Climate Data Portal. So that's going to be a public interface. So it's going to be akin. I don't know if folks are aware of the Rainfall Atlas. At Tom John Luca's team is this where you can go and you know drop a pin and see what your mean annual annual rainfall. It's going to be akin to that. So we'll have these products basically posted daily, and then the next the other part of that project is actually integrate it with the National Weather Service. They have a red flag warning system, for example. Um, so basically making it used by forecasters as well. Um, there's an interesting comment here for what it's worth uh, in terms of unmanaged ungulate impacts on fuel load, deer overgrazing on the lanai has almost completely extirpated some of the taller high fires grass species from central Palawai and Mickey Basin areas. Grass fuel load is super low. There are a bunch of other issues that come with overgrazing, but tall grass isn't clearly one of them in the old ag fields. That's super interesting. And I've heard the same thing. Those fires in central Maui pushed a ton of deer up Malka. Uh, into Ulupalakua Ranch and into Haleakala Ranch, and they're having big issues with impacts on their forage. So I, I believe it. Um, uh, it's also interesting is that, you know, some of these climate projections that I've run for the fire risk, when it gets too dry, like sort of below a certain rainfall threshold, fire risk goes back down, right? Because you just don't have enough, it's too arid for plants to grow. Um, so that's another factor that's gonna start to come into play, if not already. Oh, that's right. John, that was from John Sprague, not Rachel. He's using his <laughs> Rachel's account. Thanks for that. That's a really cool observation. And uh, again, I mean, there's evidence of like, it just depends what kind of densities you're talking about. Um, and uh, I think like there's really no substitute for directing this, right? It's something that we could actually intentionally manipulate. People have been in Hawaii for, for a long, long time. Um, and I go, it's controversial, like whether or not grazing is, you know, should be part of what how we use these but to my mind if you have a million acres of grassland you're not going to take a weed whacker out and fix that problem so um and i think for those of us working in restoration we kind of know a million acres is sort of beyond reforestation efforts in the current state in which they exist right so trying to work with what we have and within the sort of being pragmatic But that again, as in my opinion, what is that? The UH, uh, KTUH, the views and views and opinions here are not the <laughs> are not those of the management staff or underwriters. <laughs> um, but I don't see any other questions. Oh, one new message. Okay, you want me to take? I'll just take it. You guys can sit back. From a prevention management standpoint. Are we utilizing a prescribed grazing program with sheep and other ungulates along reforestation, along a prescribed burn program to prevent such large biomass fuel loads to grow? Yeah, I think the simple answer is no. Um, I think it's starting to happen. So on the restoration side, there are folks like Pu'uawa, Waikoloa Dry Forest who are definitely doing fuels management around their, around their their areas where they're working, right? They know that like, if you plant the tree and walk away and there's all grass everywhere, it's gonna burn, right? So in those kind of instances, people are integrating fire management. Um, and that's really like the bulk of the work we were doing with Pacific Fire Exchange is kind of like, yeah, like we just need to do the basics like preparation and planning, right? So that you're, you're sort of doing some of this stuff alongside the, the work you really wanna do. Um, as far as large scale grazing, there's been some efforts uh, so 
PTA and Parker Ranch have kind of been going back and forth for a long time, and they've been trying to do some grazing uh, up by Waikiki along the roadside there to kind of prevent fires or at least reduce the risk of fires kind of escaping in that Keamuku zone. Um, there's areas where grazing has been reintroduced, whether or not for fire risk explicitly or not, I don't know. But for example, if anyone goes to Oahu and you take Kaukonahua Road, which is the snake road down to, you, um, down to Haleiwa, Wailua, there's a new grazing lease along the roadside, which we've had one of our largest historical fires in Oahu. And it just looks fantastic, right? They're grazing the guinea grass down and knocked it way back. And so we, you know, the fire risk has definitely been reduced there. I think the trick is how do we integrate and where the opportunities lie for integration. Um, prescribed fire is a whole nother animal. Um, Maui County Fire Department is doing it. Uh, I think if you were to talk to them, like they think they'd be pretty honest in saying that they're doing it for fuels management, but it's also equally valuable for them just as training, you know? And I think that they're probably would admit that they're not doing it at a scale that's gonna really make a big dent on fire risk. Um, yeah, so Mike has pointed out there are some managed grazing projects in collaboration with Forest Restoration and Puuawa and some other smaller examples. So the example I got showed in Waianae, um, that's kind of integrated. And so it's kind of been cool because Bulo got the sheep going and now Eric at the back of the call has got sheep as well, trying to knock down the fuels. Um, Puuawa, the DOFA, Puuawa has been working with there's three leaseholders within the, the forest reserve. And so they have had been in active conversation with them to try to kind of coordinate grazing as a fire risk reduction tool. Um, I think one of the realities that people have to understand for grazing, I'm gonna be frank here, is that it's for most people doing it, it's not a, for, it's not a money maker. Um, they're barely scraping by, right? So in order to kind of like really approach this where you're gonna say, we want you guys to graze here at these times of the year, um, we need to think about it as a service that they're providing and one that they get paid for. And this is not speaking as like an opinion, but this is literally how it works in other parts of the world. So in California, they've got huge programs in um, Port Portugal and Spain. They're grazing thousands of kilometers of fuel breaks and the forestry departments there pay the grazers to do the work. Um, Mike also adds that the public perception, Mike, you want to jump, you should just jump on, but the public perception of prescribed fire is very negative here. Um, you know, one of the reasons, I mean, it's not the only reason, the big reason is economics, but, you know, on Maui, they really got pressure to shut down the, um, the plantations because of the fires, because of the smoke from the fire. Um, the irony is they got much worse smoke and much more dangerous fires after they shut down the plantation. So it's one of these things, I think on the mainland, it's more um, kind of entering the lexicon and people's brains, like living with fire. Like this is, again, it's a thing we have to live with. Like we see these fires burn and, you know, no significant outside from Waianae Kai, that place I showed you, no significant changes have been really made elsewhere on West Oahu. Like Nana Cooley has some grazing in the lower valley, but like, that burned in 2015 and we just got lucky this last summer that it didn't burn um you know and so that's kind of where we're at like we're kind of like we see these things happen they're these large scary incidents and we have very limited capacity i mean mike can talk directly to this much more than i can but very limited capacity to like intervene after the fact or for, get ready for the next one <clears throat> Hey, Claire, I think we're, we're um, just about out of time. Um, I was just informed through a, a private chat that there's an active fire on the Big Island right now. Um, uh, runaway brush fire in the area below Kohala Ranch on the ocean side of Highway 270. So I'm sure a lot of the uh, attendees here are going to have to run now and uh, take care of that. But um, I did want to thank you again for, as always, a really interesting and alarming presentation. <laughs> But you do provide us with a bit of optimism as well. Um, some 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 cool research going on. And I wanted to remind everyone if you missed any of the talk or you want to catch some of it again, um, the recording should be available on the Big Island Invasive Species Committee website in about a week. And uh, for the all the rest of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month, there's all really interesting talks scheduled for the rest of the month. So 
please visit uh, the HiSAM website to see what's coming up, including two really great talks tomorrow. So and, uh, with that- One more plug, one more plug. Next sure. week, the 15th, we're doing this, uh, we're kind of showcasing this weed risk, weed virus assessment tool for us. So pacificfireexchange.org and the events will be right at the top. You can, you can register for that. It's basically akin to Chuck's work with the weed risk assessment, but it's really looking at fire risk per, per species to maybe help prioritize weed management. So very pertinent to the audience, I think. And uh, that, that a about. link to that presentation has been put in the chat multiple times. So yeah, definitely I, I've seen uh, that work and it's I think it's gonna be a really useful tool to fire management yeah. and prevention in Hawaii. So thanks so much, Clay. Thanks everyone for attending and uh, uh, have a great rest of your day. All right, take care, everybody. Yeah, and anyone reach out if you got questions. Don't hesitate to, to send me an email. <laughs>